haven't been blessed by the six series. We're gonna close it out. I don't know what's gonna break out on this stage, but I want you to engage with us as we engage with Holy Spirit in our conversation about worship. And oftentimes with church, you know, I've gotten so many text messages today, man, preach, pre preach like you're losing your mind, preach, driving crazy, all that kind of stuff. And I said, I'm preaching Tuesday. Uh, t t today, we're gonna have a conversation about worship. And I think church has to have that ability to be diverse in its scope, right? That we're not one dimensional, that we can be multi dimensional in our expressions of how we communicate this gospel. So as we begin to talk about the idea and the concept and the responsibility of worship, I wanted to bring up a few that I thought um, would be, could add to the conversation in this 930 service. So I'm, a, I'm gonna call them up, they're gonna come as I call them. First person with the call is our director of creative worship. In the person of uh, Nichelle Duhart Gaines, you would help. You would help him up. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's celebrate as she comes. Glory to God. Um, Anitra Little from our from Vertical Worship and Wa Music. Let's bring up. I mean, Ricky Little as he's coming. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, our AP associate pastor, Pastor Kim Husbeth. Uh, uh, one of our worship leaders as well, and while music, Tanisha Smith. Let's receive her as she comes. And Prophet Michael Dubois Kwame. Let's receive him as he comes. <laughs> I'm so grateful that you guys decided to do this with me. We've been in this Seek series dealing with the idea, the premise, and the concept of worship. And it's been amazing because one of the things that the Spirit of God had told me <clears throat> before is I've designated this house as a house of worship. And one of the things I think we started with in our Genesis as the Rock Fellowship was word and worship. We had no fluff. We cut out all the pork. We didn't have long announcements. We didn't have a lot of anything. First of all, we were too broke to have anything to do anything. <laughs> we were, but number two, uh, it was the heartbeat of God to allow our church to become a portal in San Antonio for the presence of God to regularly visit us. And so much so, we saw the supernatural break out. I'm not gonna get into that, but our church began in worship, right? And uh, all of you have been there since just about day one or week one or week two. At least you've been there the first year. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that and kind of jump into this idea of worship. First question I have is, does participating, is when you think about corporate worship and you think about everything that goes along with that, my first question is, does participating in corporate worship, really, does it really matter? And I'm going to ask and address that to Pastor Kim. Does it really matter that we participate in corporate, corporate worship? Uh, I think uh, as a body, when we come together, the significance of coming together in worship um, really plays uh, an important part in our walk with Christ, uh, especially we only meet what once or twice in the week and coming to the sanctuary with your brother and sister and running with them it has a whole nother uh, level of impact than it is when we're on our own. Uh, if we're a body, and I say this all the time, if we're a body, then there's a part that you play in the kingdom that I don't play. And so when we all collectively come together and we're assigned to this house, that means your voice and your sound uh, has an impact on what happens to me in the matter of worship. Uh, there's a force that happens when children come together uh, and they seek after their father. Romans 15 speaks to uh, when brethren live in harmony. Uh, Paul says that when you live in harmony, you come together with unity. Then you can come together in one voice together and give glory to God. Meaning that there is an assignment that we have. There's a directive that there should be a meeting time when we come together and have one voice and one sound and give glory to God. That's where his glory lives. Your voice could break something that's happening to me. Your pursuit encourages me. And so I think that's why it's, it's good. And th there's an emptying that happens in worship. There's an emptying that happens in worship. And so while you're doing that, it pushes my brother and my sister on the side of me to do the same. You don't know what you're really breaking in another realm when we come to collect collectively in worship. And so that it's important to lift your hands and let yourself go because you don't know what you're doing. There's enough power in you to shift 
anything, this one room. The Bible says Elijah was one man in the heavens. He said not to rain, and it didn't rain. So imagine what you can do yourself in the realm of worship, just you. You have the power to shift this room on your own. So imagine what happens when we all collectively do that. So it's very important that we all participate in corporate worship. Beautiful answer. I want to I wanna stay there for a little bit. I want to give pass it over to anyone else who wants to jump in. But you're saying that in corporate worship, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as a student, right? In corporate worship, what you're saying is there is something that can happen in the moment that we're collectively coming together that what this person may be doing and their pursuit can break something actually in me, that that connectivity of that moment. Very much so. Very much so. The, the power of unity um you know, together, the principle doesn't break. If anybody comes together with one purpose and one agenda, then nothing is impossible. Uh, that's biblical, and that's something that's been proven. Uh, so if, if we all come together and there's sickness in my body and we're worshiping our God of healing, your, again, your pursuit and your agreement has enough power to break sickness. Uh, this is something that, uh, as, uh, as a church, we have to all be aware of worship and seeking God. Uh, it's not about necessarily us, but the pursuit of him. He turns his ear to us to hear what we're saying when we cry out. It's the same thing as parents and children. Uh, I can walk through a store, and it's I, I giggle and laugh all the time because I hear, I'll hear a child say, M Mama. And I automatically, it's not my child, but I hear the term, and I immediately turn my attention to that. Our Father is the same way. And so when you, when you come, come to him and you, you give him all you have and we're crying out, Abba, Father, we have the power not just for our own situations. And I think that's what we have to understand. Corporate worship is not about us. It's about all of us collectively. We have to realize the power that's in worship when we call on the name of Jesus. And that's something we have to, to realize, especially going into this new year for this house. So then let me just piggyback there. So then if I'm, if I'm not participating, I'm possibly frustrating something that heaven wants to do in that moment. Most definitely. And it's all done. It's all, and I know the thing is, and here's the thing, guys. I know it's, it's uncomfortable for some of us. It's uncomfortable because, and, and, and here's the thing. If you don't do it at home, it gets uncomfortable when you get into the corporate place. That's why worship should start on our own, in our own closets, in our own cars, in our own places. So it doesn't take it doesn't take a long time to jump in the river when you've already come wet. Okay, so so th that's how it how it has to happen. But if you don't worship, if you don't empty yourself and give God all you have, so He can give it back to you, then you could be frustrating what's supposed to happen in this whole worship service. What's supposed to happen for me? Um, we have to really come to agreement with what God says about us and how much power and authority we have. I think it's an authority, it's an identity issue. Because if we really knew who he was and who we were, we would run after him a whole other way. We would see this thing a whole other way. I depend on you, you depend on me. So yes, if you don't participate, you are frustrating something that's not in a whole other realm. You're frustrating it because there's something that you bring in the corporate worship that some of us don't have. So it's very important. Beautiful. Let's give up the Lord a great round of applause for that. Rick, I want to ask you a question, man. What is the benefit of worship, though? Uh, the benefit of worship. Uh, I would say a benefit of worship is the drawing close. The drawing. As you get closer to God, he draws closer to you. How else are you supposed to know what you're supposed to do, your identity, your purpose, if you're, you're not drawing close? So the benefit of that is you discover who you are as well as discovering who God is. So if you don't spend any time, you're not going to know who he is or yourself. What am I supposed to do, Lord? We'll draw close. He's not a father that just sees it and is like, okay. He's like, oh, you want to know? Yes, come here. I want to talk to you. It's a, oh, the drawing is the benefit. The closeness is a benefit. It's intimacy. 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 It's closeness. The more you get close, the more it, it just becomes. And you, you start to, like, it feels, if, it, it feels like, oh, God, you're just, you know, you're here with me always. And he is, but you begin to feel, like, grounded in that. Like, you know what? He is here. Hey, Dad, you know, it's, hey, God, you know, it's that closeness. That is a benefit, drawing close. The unit, the, just the, 
the conversation, the communion with God. That's a benefit. Beautiful. Anybody else want to jump in? Anyone? I think worship should always be a posture. I think sometimes people who don't know, they feel like it has to look a certain way. And I think that God really rests on the honesty and transparency of the spirit and of the soul. I think some people feel like it should... He Stop right there. Stop. That just I'm a processor, like two seconds of delay. You said God rests on honesty and transparency. Dig. Um, I find in my personal relationship with God that I find him most when I try not to be fancy with my words. Yes. Because No, because he's God, so sometimes our flesh feels like, oh, most holy father. And, you know, and it's, oh, you're reverencing him, and you should. Your posture should always have a reverence and respect because he is God, but I think he lies so deep in, well, Lord, I know I shouldn't be confused, but I'm confused. Or, Lord, I know you love me, but I don't feel like you love me. And in those moments, in those moments of transparency and honesty, and when he, he really goes deep. And I think because the enemy tries to make us feel like he's this big God that you have to come to him, right? Instead of, I just want to be with you. And that's why it's so easy to... Um, access his presence when you understand like there's no striving yep. I have to do nothing to deserve this you are want, wanting and longing to be with me and that's how we fall in love with him yeah. oh. it's knowing that he loves us Oh, I, I love this because it, it, it changes the, that, the dynamic of I have to try to do a checklist before I can get into his presence For let me repent let me apologize, let me promise to never do this, let me remember everything that I possibly can, you know, the things that I repent of the sins I remember and the things I don't, you know how we be saying that, things I did that I know I did and things I don't know what I did you know, you know you know what you did it, it, you know, that, that checklist doesn't exist that in, in that moment that I need to just be with God, I can just be with God that changes everything, doesn't it? Yeah. That I think sometimes we don't worship because we are so condemned. Yeah. Or the, and, and I think we, we possibly minimize. Uh, first of all, we, over, we overestimate at times the power of the devil. You know, he's God's devil. And he's only one place at one time. Right? He's in D.C. right now. He's, he's only in one place. I didn't say who he was with. I just said he's, he's in D.C. But some of that's just our own psychology and how we were taught and what we assumed about God. Is that what you're saying? Anybody else want to jump on that real quick? What is the benefit of worship real quickly before we move to the next question? Yeah, I don't know the benefits. I, I, I will kind of piggyback on, on Tanisha um, when she made mention to um, not striving in the word transparency that she used. Uh, when you were preaching on worship a few months back, you mentioned John 4, 23 and 24, where the scripture says that they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, and that word truth actually meaning hiding nothing. Yeah. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not coming in his presence trying to cover myself or like Adam in the presence trying to hide or cover, but I'm completely open. I'm transparent. And so uh, that transparency that she mentioned is critical uh, in worship. And we must come hiding nothing, knowing he sees everything, yes. knowing he already sees everything. He knows already, uh, but we're open and there is no condemnation. Ooh, I love that. How do you balance the, the because I know you're a busy, busy person and, and many people are busy. How do you balance uh, a worship lifestyle with life's demands? How do you how do you do that? So the essence of worship itself, the first time worship is even mentioned in scripture in Genesis law first mentioned, it's it's connected to sacrifice. So there is no worship without sacrifice. That's the essence of what worship is. It's, it's sacrifice. And so just like anything else, uh, you make time for what you value. One thing about Abraham, in Abraham's journey, he built altars. So I have the mindset every day of building altars, setting aside a time to commune with God. If you have to put it in your calendar, hey, this hour or this 30 minutes is set apart for my time with God, that's what you do. You've got to schedule your time out, uh, whether it's in the morning, a lunch break, 
in the evening before you go to sleep, you have to schedule it. Because if you just think in your mind, I'm going to do it, uh, time is going gonna, is gonna to move and you're not going to leverage that space. So there is, it's the practical things that we don't do. It's the simple things that we miss. Schedule time. If you value it enough, you'll schedule it. And when it's scheduled, when it's in your phone, when you get that alarm, when your phone kind of goes off, you know this time is God's. This time is set apart. It's his. This is his tent. This is his, his portion. So create that space. Beautiful. So you call it building altars. Building altars. I think somebody yeah. to write that down. Yeah. I'm going to build me. Because, you know, when you think about it in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, they built an altar for the purpose of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Because they took time. They designated. It was actually planned perhaps weeks in advance or days in advance or in response to a supernatural moment. I remember when, the, when Jacob had a, an open air vision, open heaven vision of the ladder resting on the earth and angels ascending and descending. When he came out of that dream, he said, okay, number one, if God, you take care of me, etc., I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to pour all on this rock and call it Bethel, meaning the house of God. And he built an altar in that place to commemorate the open heaven experience, the, ex the different side of God that he saw. The different side of God. I wonder what would happen if we start making memorials when God introduces a new, a new place in himself to us. Perhaps maybe journaling will help us remember we saw another side of God. So build an altar. I like that. Let's give the Lord praise for that. Isn't that good? How many going to go home and build some altars? I mean, literally, you're going to build an altar like, and take a moment in your schedule and block out this 30 minutes right here strictly belongs to God. Hey, let me just d dispel this myth very quickly, too, because some of us come from a real... Uh, you, anyway, let me just dispel this myth. It's not that God is something magical about 5 a.m. And... Um, <laughs> And it's not about something magical of an hour. Because I think we, 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 in the 90s, 2000s, preachers, we begin to say things like, get up with more of our preachers would say, get up 5 a.m., wash your face, and wash yourself, wash your tail, and get before the Lord and pray. And people are like, I got kids. I don't know how to do that. I don't, I don't you know. And I mean, the whole, and, and you felt condemned like you didn't really get to know God unless you did thus and such. Am I right about it? I found out something about the Holy Spirit, you know, a couple of years back is that he's always talking to me. If I'm in the car, build an altar. Right? Sometimes you may have some unscheduled altars. So I think that's a, 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 beautiful, a beautiful thing. I like that. I like that expression. I think that's new language in the house is building an altar. Anitra, let me ask you a question because uh, when Anitra Little uh, came to uh, the Rock Fellowship, um, I remember her being about 18, 19 years, years of age. And, uh, and she's still so young. And, um, but she, gotta be praised. <laughs> gotta be praised. But she, she was, uh, you know, singing because she can sing uh, but you know didn't really jump out front too much at least on our stage <clears throat> and I remember uh, there was a song we used to sing uh, called uh, Feel This Place um, by uh, Prashia Hilliard and I remember uh, we would get to this part in the song The Vamp what was The Vamp initially because I know you're the songbird that know every song um, there must be so much more or something like that and, and, and something like that there's nothing we want more. And I remember the day something just switched. And we were singing, standing, and next thing I knew, she was on her knees with the mic. And uh, the house was just, and we were like, what in the world is going on? Question is, how did you develop? Because I know that didn't happen on stage. That happened at home. That happened in a personal. How did you develop your, your lifestyle, culture of worship? Yeah, um, so I grew up in a musical family, so I was always surrounded by music. Um, but I had the wonderful privilege um, to be a praise dancer as a kid. Huh? Hey, praise dancers! And, um, and under my leadership, um, he, wa he was very strategic with picking the songs. And I remember being like eight or nine years old after we were done dancing, being overwhelmed by the presence of God and just crying. I had no idea it was the presence of God. I'm just walking off stage crying and I have no idea. I'm doubled over crying and I don't know. Um, so as I grew up, um, 
especially in high school, I was always going home and spending time with God, listening to music. That was my outlet. Um, but then I, I started to get attacked uh, demonically um, with dreams. I would literally see shadows outside of my window. And the only way that I could combat that was the presence of God. Um, I didn't know how to pray at that time. I didn't have the language for it. So me being in the presence was a safe haven for myself. I had to go to him because I didn't know what else to do. So um, it developed through, uh, through seeking his face when I was afraid, when I was fearful, whenever, whenever I was feeling intimidated. I would always go to God. I would turn on Israel Houghton. Huh? God be praised. And I was literally, I would be on the floor in the middle of my room crying and praising God until I could feel the lift. Y'all. And since then, I've always chased after the presence. It wasn't a, oh, you know what? Let me get into, let me, let me go to God so I can ask for this and I can ask for that. It was just, man, I just want to be with you. And I know how I feel. I'm always safe. You are, you are a safe place. You are a refuge. Let me go back to that. I haven't been there in a couple of days. Let me go back to it. So um, I developed that lifestyle through attacks, honestly. Um, but it's, without the attack, I have deliberately been seeking his presence, seeking his face. Beautiful. Let me ask you a question. What would you say to somebody who's developing or trying to develop a lifestyle of worship? It's in the simple things. It is a posture of the heart. Turn your affections to God. The Bible says to do everything wholeheartedly unto the Lord. So whether I am walking from the parking lot inside to my job, I'm going to turn my affection towards him in that small little moment. God, I acknowledge your presence. I know that you're with me. I accept that, I acknowledge you, and I worship you right here, right now. Before I even go all the way in, before I speak to anybody else, I wanna acknowledge you first. Um, so I would say acknowledge his presence anytime, anywhere you are, turn your affections, turn your heart towards him, and lean into that. So lean turn in. your heart toward, anybody wanna, else wanna jump in on that? What would you say to a person who's trying to I agree, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Just acknowledging him. I think that's what, what matters in everything. And I think some people, they call it deep, but it's not deep. It's who we're made to be. We're made to be conscious of his presence all the time. And I feel like the enemy sometimes operates in that when we want to invite God into the things that we usually don't. But that's where he belongs. He belongs in all things. So I think it's just being aware in relationships, in decisions. People say, you ain't got to see God what you are. Yes, you do. Because he cares about that. That's saying that, God, you don't care about that. But he leans into every detail. So being, being aware and acknowledging him saying, Lord, you know what? I didn't, I didn't acknowledge you today. Or, Lord, I didn't think about this, but I've never invited you into this process. Or, Lord, I don't know what to do. I've never asked you. I'm sorry. Can you come into this? You know. That's really good. Anybody else? I was just going to say I agree. It is a heart posture in in the beginning of the day, but it's also a communion. So you have loved ones. He's your loved one as well. You talk to your loved ones on the phone every day when you find time in these moments. Let me call you. Let me text you. He's the same way. He wants to hear from you. And even, even in your uh, levels of, of uh, talking to him and you start in your beginning where it seems like you have to squint your eyes to hear him like, Afar off, you know, and then there's as you keep on communing with him and he's communing with you and then you can hear him in your ear. He's closer. And then there's other levels that when you keep on communing with him all day long, like you said, putting him in every part of your day, then he's you can feel that he's like right here. As soon as you open your mouth, it's like what you. So there are also levels to this when you talked about that intimacy the same way. So throughout your day and every moment, setting up your altar is the same thing. Okay, I feel an urgency. I need to go in the, in the restroom and pray. I just feel like I want, you know, you want it so bad, like saying that, saying hungry for it. You want it so bad, like, okay, I need to go pray. All right, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm going to take my break. I need to go walk around the building and just commune and talk to him and be with him in that moment, living human being, just being with him. It's just 
amazing. So, yeah, that's for me. Like you said, all throughout your day. All throughout your day. Your whole day is the altar. I mean, moments here and there. He's speaking to you. You're speaking to him. Y'all are communicating. It's like, man, I love you so much. And so, yeah, yeah. Remember, the Holy Spirit is not an it. It's a, he's a person. I think sometimes, too, subconsciously, we see the Holy Spirit as like this force. The Holy Spirit is an actual person that lives inside of you. So he's much closer to you than you realize. He's right in. You're a moving, you're a mobile tabernacle. He's on the inside of you. He's an actual person that actually wants to get to know you. He's a person that wants to talk to you. So translate those same principles. The way you get to know somebody on an intimate level, he's a, he's a person, he's an individual, he has a voice, he has a way of communicating. Communicate, learn that, learn his communication style. Get to know and learn him as a person uh, and allow yourself to be transformed. So if I'm a man, I am, but if, if I'm speaking for the brothers, if you're a brother and you... I'm not really used to becoming expressive, but, you know, when the presence of God shows up, um, you know, and you're, you're in that presence, and you, you, I remember wanting to be a part, but being, for some reason, thinking, everybody's looking at me, and nobody's paying me no attention, right? I remember feeling like I need to, some, I want to... <laughs> But at the same time, being somewhere, as a man, how do you break past, I'm, I, I have an answer, but I want y'all to answer this. How do you break past the cool? How do you, how do you break past the chill? Okay. How do you let yourself become reckless? Uh, I'll speak for myself personally, and, and I, I know many people see me in the worship experience, and so that's, that's why I wanted Ricky to go first. I'm like, Ricky, go ahead and go first, man. <laughs> I know publicly, I'm a very conservative, you know, kind of guy. I'm not the most expressive, uh, you know, or, or, or what have you. Um, but in terms of my personal relationship with God, I'm very expressive or very, um, probably more so emotional in my private time. And I looked at biblical figures. I looked at, I, I look at David. I look at Elijah, I look at Elisha, and I say, all these men in Scripture were worshipers. All these men in Scripture um, were prophetic. All these men in Scripture uh, had, had this divine, the Bible says, when, in, in reference to Moses, this, this is, God tells, told the prophets, he says, when I communicate to you by way of a vision or a dream, that's the most basic way in which I communicate to anybody. He said, Moses beheld the form of the Lord. Moses knew me face to face. The way we hear from God typically is basic. Yeah. Yeah. Moses heard from God in a completely different dimension. These are men. Yeah. So when I see these men, I ask myself, where are the men in this generation? Because the paradigm has been, men set the tone of the paradigm in scripture for the worship experience. So I, I think culture, American culture or, or, or black American cultures, I'm speaking to my audience, has kind of socialized us to think that we have to be a certain way. Um, but but I, I would encourage men, look at the male biblical figures beginning from Adam. Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. These men already set the tone. They've established the paradigm. Uh, receive that impartation. Accept that. Embrace that. Uh, and, and know that uh, in his presence, uh, anything can happen. Anything is possible. Let yourself be transformed. Let yourself go. Beautiful. That's good. And like he said, looking at the men of, in, the, in the scripture, uh, one thing that I would say all of them had was they understood that they are nothing without God. So that you can put that with pride. Knock it down. You're nothing without God. You're nothing. Everything that you need, everything you want, everything that you are is in God. So you have to be like, okay, Lord, you know what? I'm nothing without you. I need you. So that, that opens up right there because the, there's a level of intimacy there. Like she said, you know, sometimes, God, I don't trust you. And I feel that, you know, you don't love me. The, all those things that, that comes in that intimacy. So being like, you know what? I have to lay myself down because I know that I don't have all the answers. You do. You're the author and the finisher. You have everything. I have to lay myself down. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. You, ex you 
provide everything for me. I, I'm just here doing exactly what you tell me to do. So really, I'm, I'm the background. You're the forefront. I'm nothing. That's all I got. I'm nothing. We, we need to break this, too, this, this stigma of um, prayer or worship being feminine. Yeah. Yes. I think like if you if you came up in a Kojic church or a Kojic background, when you think of prayer or, or wailing at the altar, you think of an older woman dressed in all white, and that's what we saw. So in, in the subcon in the in the conscious mind is oh that's that's feminine. Well, I have brothers that are reluctant to join the prayer team because in their mind, hey, that all that wailing and travailing that's 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 kind of feminine. That has to be broken. I think that when that's broken, we'll see an emergence or a resurgence of male leadership within the church context, <laughs> taking the charge and leading in, in, in the space of worship and prayer. So, Years ago, I was at a conference called Manpower back in 2000 or 19, yeah, 2000. And I remember, uh, you know, I, I'm newly saved to some degree. I've uh, been saved at that point two years, I think. And I remember going to the conference with... Um, uh, some members of my former church. We drove to Dallas, Texas, the reunion center, and we were standing outside waiting to go in. It's a men's conference. This brother passed out from heat exhaustion. It's the middle of the summer, he passed out. It's, it's hot, he passes out. The brothers just start singing over him. Uh, I will call upon the Lord. You know, I don't have a voice right now, but I will call upon the Lord. Who is worthy? And I mean, we started, Hosanna. Blessed within 20 or 30 seconds, a presence manifested in the midst of two, three hundred men in line. It was so heavy that I remember, mind you, I'm two years in Christ, two years in Christ, and I know I'm in Christ, put it that way. And I remember feeling such a, a place of peace and a place of weight. In that moment, that when men worship, something supernatural happens. Uh, I'm not saying that when women worship, it doesn't. I'm just saying when you put men in a spot and we get to really, really going after God hard in the paint, the heavens rent in a way that I, I, can't, I can't express it. 20 seconds. Not only was the man healed, but the glory of God waited on us. Men were in tears just singing Hosanna, you know? And so I, I concur that we need to break that stigma. I remember growing up in church seeing uh, that what you said. I saw that, and I, I saw prayer as, um, you know, you know, you know, ha, ma, 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 ha, you know, just the whole, you know. Yeah, and it was that, you know. And then we think, I think we preach things that sometimes sound feminine, um, you know, giving birth and, you know, you know, you, you know come on, man, get, get, you know, push it out. All the brothers are like, <laughs> fam, I don't know how to do, do anything like that. That's not part of our DNA, man. We just wait. <laughs> I don't even want to see it, you know, just wait on it. Just give me the manifestation, right? And so I, I feel like that is, that's a bigger discussion there. I want to ask this last question. I want to stop because when we, when we move in worship and prayer, we move, when, we move, when we move in worship, real, true intimacy with God in a corporate setting, uh, more than just worship breaks out in his presence, but also the prophetic. Can you correlate that prophet of how worship kind of uh, moves into with the prophetic and then we'll be done? Most certainly. We can, we can take an example from the wise men. These are pagan men who caught revelation that the Messiah was born. They come to see Jesus, and the moment they see him, the scripture says they bow down and they worship. That's the first thing they did when they lay their eyes on him. They bow down and they worship. After they worship, or during that time of worship, the scripture says that they open up gifts and begin to present him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we have a paradigm of worship, and then there's a presentation or an unfolding of gifts. There's a dynamic of the spirit that when we come together corporately to worship, there's a manifestation or an opening of gifts, gifts of the prophetic, gifts of word of knowledge, gifts of healing, Gifts of miracle signs, wonders, but to speak to stick specifically to the prophetic, uh, that is a gift that does manifest when we come together and worship corporately. There's a, a blanket that rests on God's people. Uh, and it's so strong that it becomes contagious. In a worship experience, when the prophetic breaks out, 
we could be in one place prophesying all night long. And you have the power to turn it on or to turn it off. Because the spirit of a prophet is subject to a prophet. So when we come together and we worship, lesson from the wise men, gifts open up, gifts begin to manifest. There's a portal, there's a blanket that, that comes upon God's people and any and everybody in that room is able to access that gift. It can flow it, like a yawn. It's contagious. It's, it's a flow that just remains. It's a flow that's constant. Um, and that's the power of worship. It creates portals, prophetic portals, word of knowledge portals, healing portals, all kinds of things begin to open up in the worship experience. So possibly we don't see the supernatural in a lot of, in a lot of places, in a lot of cities and regions. Like San Antonio is known for being, um, <clears throat> has been known, has been known for being somewhat traditional. And I believe that heaven is raising up places. And, uh, and I don't believe that places uh, are movements. I believe that men have movements, that movements begin in men first. I believe that Azusa was started because of a man named William Seymour. And I believe full gospel started because of a man named Bishop Paul S. Morton. So a movement. Listen, Christianity started through a man named Jesus. Every, every, every movement comes out of a man. And I believe that God is raising up men and women who, who are carrying something that are changing the dynamics of this city's historical context and bringing us into a new future with all new things and fresh things. So with that being said, I think possibly maybe we're not seeing the supernatural. See, we, we hear a lot about miracle signs and wonders. That's the thing to say now. That's a thing to say now. It's a thing to say. It, it's a buzzword for the kingdom. Miracle signs and wonders. But are we really seeing it? Because if the miracle is a job, then you foolish because that's not a miracle. You could do that on your own. You could do a job without God. Uh, but a miracle sign and wonder is something that God had to put his miraculous into the situation. Meaning cancer drying up. That's a miracle, right? Uh, when they told you you're going to die and you're still here, that's a miracle. And so I think maybe we're not seeing the miracles because we're not really in corporate worship. Perhaps maybe there's a place in God in corporate worship that we can get to where we, where we see the supernatural in such a way. The thing is getting everybody in one place on one accord. It took 120 days for them to do that in the upper room. But when it happened, we're still benefiting from what was released on earth through those persons, through 50 days, I'm sorry, these people up in, 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 uh, in the upper room, was 120 people impacted by that move. So it took, it took 50 days. Y'all, that's two, two and that, two, almost, two, almost two months of getting everybody on one place in one accord. Are y'all here? So I believe that perhaps maybe as we are engaging with the Holy Spirit, that I believe those worship moments matter. That when we are in church and praise and worship to not be something you just slide in late to. I, matter of fact, it's more than just the worship. Prayer is a part of worship. When you know we got prayer at 12, you hear at 1150 at the latest. Prepare yourself for the worship experience. Are you here? That when prayer begins, that's a part of getting me prepared to be with God, right? We're talking to God. We're having conversation with God. And so I believe that uh, that's, that's something that I don't think that, oh, man, the church starts at 930. Okay. All right. Well, he don't get up to preach till about 1015. So I got time. You're not a worshiper. Worshipers don't think that way. Worshipers are like, I was glad when they said to me. And it's not let us go. I got to go <laughs> to the house of the Lord. And so in the parking lot, you, you're excited. When you pull it into the drop, you, you're excited. When you see the front line leaders out front saying, welcome to all nations, you're excited. When you come and they sit you anywhere in the house. I say anywhere in the house. You're excited. You know, and you've got great anticipation, great expectation. And not just here, but anywhere. I think that's part of what we should carry. Let's give this round, uh, give a round of applause to these beautiful men and women. Can we do that? Can we celebrate our own? Thank you so much. These.